Good morning. On behalf of Northwestern University Staff Advisory Council and the Office of the President, I would like to welcome you to the President's Annual State of the University Address. My name is Jason Gerhalski, and I'm currently the Chair of the Staff Advisory Council. NUSAC, NUSAC is very proud to be a sponsor of this annual event. As you are aware, once a year, NUSAC and the Office of the President come together to organize the State of the University Address. This event is an important one, not only because the President shares remarks with the community on the university's progress and success over the past years, but also because the university community has an opportunity to engage in dialogue with the President. The State of the University Address is being webcast to the Northwestern community. In addition to those joining us here in the forum in the McCormick Tribune Center, this event is being webcast to the Thorne Auditorium on the Chicago campus. And for community members who are unable to attend one of the designated campus venues, this, they may view this event by webcast from their computers. As many of you know, an event with this scope requires work in collaboration of numerous university staff departments and I would like to take a few moments now to recognize the key members of the Northwestern community whose hard work has contributed to the ongoing success of this address. The staff at Academic Technologies in particular has been very helpful. Uh, I'd like to thank Bob Davis, Harlan Wallach, Mike Curtis, Chris Ostertag, Zorn Illick, Larry Amiot, Trevor Bergman, Ivan Myers, Cameron Bill, Donald Kenyon, Stephanie Foster, and Caleb Lawson. From Facilities Management, Joe Sack. And from the Department of University Relations, Al Cubbage, Stacy Roberts, Douglas Kim, and Ann Egger. I'd also like to thank President Beenan and the university administrators who are in, in attendance this morning. And I would also like to give a very special thanks to um, some special members of NUSAC who are, were particularly helpful uh, organizing this. Our Vice Chair, Deb Cundiff, and the Communications Committee Chair, Rebecca Griffith. The President will begin in a few moments. The following the President's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. There are several ways in which community members may participate. Here at the forum, we would like attendees to use the microphone down front to ask questions. On the Chicago venue, attendees uh, should have received note cards and pencils on which you may write down your question, give it to one of our NUSAC members, and they will bring the question down front, and it will be transmitted to the Evanston campus. For those of you who are watching on your computer, you may send your questions to the NUSAC email address, which is newsac at northwestern.edu. I am now pleased to introduce Northwestern's 15th president, Henry S. Beenan. President Beenan is in President Beenan is in his 13th year of office, making him the fourth longest serving president in Northwestern's history. In that time, the university has made tremendous progress under his direction. Thanks to his dedicated leadership, Northwestern is one of the premier academic institutions in the country. It is in excellent shape financially and is home to truly outstanding faculty, staff, and students. Prior to coming to Northwestern, President Beenan was Dean of the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs and James S. McDonald Distinguished University Professor at Princeton University, where he was also a professor for 30 years. He has been a consultant to the State Department, the World Bank, the National Security Council, and served on the Senior Review Panel of the CIA. President Beenan is a renowned scholar of political science and international affairs, an extremely knowledgeable fan of all Northwestern's athletic teams, and the person who has led this university to the position of promise prominence that it holds today. Please join me in welcoming Northwestern's 15th president, Henry S. Beenan. Thank you very much, Jason. And thank you for your introduction. And thanks to NUSAC for sponsoring this opportunity to talk with the Northwestern community each year. This is the first time we've had this event in the McCormick Tribune Forum, so I'd also like to extend my thanks to Medill for hosting us. Uh, as Jason said, and as it's been for the past few years, the speech is being webcast, and NUSAC has set up an email for people to send in questions, and I anticipate there will be questions, so I'll speak 
relatively briefly in order to leave time to answer them. I've been traveling a lot, as I often do in my job, talking to alumni and other supporters of the university. And uh, I very much enjoy doing this because we have a great story to tell at Northwestern. Terrific students, remarkable faculty achievements, excellent administrative support, and an ever-strengthening university. In my talks, when I'm going around the country and around the world, I often can highlight only a few uh, people and a few of the major things we're doing, just as will be the case today. I am, however, keenly aware of the excellent work done by all our faculty, as well as our dedicated administrative and support staff. <clears throat> and all these people make possible our teaching and research efforts. All of you are critical to the continued success of our endeavor, and I appreciate your good work. I am pleased to report, as Jason also alluded to, that Northwestern is in excellent shape, both academically and financially. I'll talk first about academic matters. As many of you know, we recently announced that the Kellogg School of Management will offer two certificate programs for undergraduates, one in financial economics starting this fall and one in man uh, managerial analytics starting in 2008. These programs will provide a very strong foundation as well as advanced study in key areas of finance and management. Th there are plenty of seats. Please come. People should feel free to do that as they come in. I was saying that uh, these Kellogg programs will provide a strong foundation as well as uh, uh, giving us a possibility for advanced study in key areas of finance and management for our undergraduates who are considering a career in business. And I'm very pleased that we will be able to offer these innovative programs. I commend the work of the faculty and administrators in Kellogg, the Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences, and the McCormick School of Engineering and Applied Sciences for their cooperative effort in creating this program and developing the courses. They've done better in figuring out the economics of this than Dean Jane and I did as we drove from Delhi to Jaipur and did our back of the envelope calculations, which were off by a factor of two. So everybody should always be aware of back of the envelope calculations, even by people who think they know numbers. There's also been, I think, uh, uh, a very uh, good impetus that we'll get from this Kellogg program. I, I don't know whether we'll see it yet in, uh, in applications because we announced the program uh, a little bit late for admissions, but I think we'll see it in enrollments, and I think the main thing is it's going to be a real great strengthening for our undergraduate curriculum and help us attract really excellent students who are interested in these particular fields. Medill has also been undergoing a significant change. The entire Medill faculty spent uh, 20 hours a week last spring in intensive courses for faculty that brought in academic and professional leaders in the field from around the world. Twelve faculty teams at Medill have spent the fall working on a new curriculum which is now in the process of being developed. Additionally, the Kaplan Freshman Humanities Program will offer a new set of interdisciplinary courses during freshman year, including team-taught courses. The program will start next fall as a four-course sequence of seminars and lectures under the rubric of the Good Society. Faculty and students, both from WCAS and the School of Communication, will be invited to participate. We're grateful to Morris Kaplan and Dolores Cole Kaplan for their continuing support of the humanities at Northwestern, and their recent gift really enables us to establish a very innovative program. We've also had some very interesting talks with educational leaders overseas about the possibility of establishing some new Northwestern programs abroad. These would actually be Northwestern degree granting programs abroad. And while these discussions have advanced beyond the preliminary stages, they're not finalized. So what I've just said is more tantalizing than anything else. We'll really hold off saying more other than to note that uh, if we can bring these to culmination, they'll provide some exciting possibilities for extending Northwestern's reach and our offerings in some key areas to places outside the United States, and hopefully that would in the end provide opportunities for our students to also be in some of these places and to avail themselves of uh, new surroundings and new possibilities beyond the United States. So I hope, it's my hope at least, that we can bring these to conclusion fairly soon. It's also my hope I can turn the pages here. 
There are also physical signs of change as we develop and strengthen our facilities to support our educational programs. We will begin construction this spring on the new molecular therapeutics and diagnostics building just south of the Evanston Northwestern Healthcare Panko Life Sciences Pavilion. The new facility, which we expect to be ready for occupancy in fall 2009, will house researchers from both Weinberg and McCormick and will include state-of-the-art imaging center on the first floor. In accordance with our policy of using sustainable design for our new buildings, the molecular therapeutics and design uh, diagnostics building has been designed as a green building and we expect to obtain LEED certification as a silver building as we did recently with the Ford uh, Center. The building will be named Richard and Barbara Silverman Hall for molecular therapeutics and diagnostics. This is an extraordinary story. Rick Silverman, the John Evans Professor of Chemistry and the discoverer of Lyrica, has designated a portion of the royalties he receives to Northwestern to help fund the construction of the new building. Rick is a superb teacher, scholar, inventor, and researcher. It gladdens me to have this naming opportunity for Rick and Barbara. The renovation of Annie Mae Swift Hall also should begin this spring and be completed next year. The renovation will include a complete upgrade of all the mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and architectural systems in the building. A new theater facility will be provided in order to provide additional space for teaching, and there will be new space for graduate students. As we announced last fall, we'll convert the Northeast Recreation Field on the lakefront to an artificial turf field for varsity and club sports and intramurals. The existing soccer field will then become a parking lot the project also includes the expansion of the Cook Hall parking lot for a total net gain of 400 parking spaces in that area. The plan is to have everything complete for uh, fall quarter, um, and we would hope to do this for fall quarter 2007, but there are regulatory review processes that we have to go through that could possibly delay our schedule. The renovation and expansion of the Searle Student Health Center is in design and we expect to go to bid this year. That project will provide a new reception intake area, new waiting areas, expanded number of doctor's offices and treatment rooms, an expanded pharmacy, additional space for counseling and psychological services, and the relocation of the Life Skills Center into expanded space. Folks, again, if you want to sit down who are standing in the back, there are plenty of seats. We've also established a housing advisory committee that is studying our needs for student housing on the Evanston campus. At the same time, our food service is engaged in an evaluation and planning process to complement the housing study. The information gathered in these two studies will guide us as we develop plans for our residence halls and dining halls in the future. And I think this is a very important area for the university to address itself to. On the Chicago campus, the renovation of Weebolt Hall for the School of Continuing Studies is underway. This includes a new gateway space for SCS on the first floor, renovated classrooms, new windows, and upgraded building systems. Construction is underway on the build-out of the ninth floor of the Robert H. Lurie Medical Research Center, and design is beginning for the build-out of the tenth floor, which will be bid later this year. When the tenth floor is done, it will complete the fit-out of the entire Lurie Research Center. We're very grateful to the state of Illinois for its support of this project, particularly for the most recent uh, funding for enabling us to build out the 10th floor. Renovation of the 8th floor of the Rubloff Building for offices for the law school was just completed, and the design of new classrooms on the first floor is underway. And I should mention the extraordinarily successful renovation of the first floor space in Norris for a Starbucks coffee shop and new lounge that opened in January. Anyone who's been over there at almost any time of the day can attest to the fact that it's a very successful project that's popular with our students. So we continue to do a lot of building. It seems to be that universities do this. It's almost a never-ending process, uh, and I hope that uh, we can bring all these projects to successful completion. And as I've said before, it's still my hope that we're able to build a new music building. It's a very high priority for me and for the provost if we can um, find the funding for this. 
Let me speak briefly about admissions. We've had a really extraordinary year in undergraduate admissions. For the second straight year, we received a record number of freshman applications for admission to the class of 2011. We received nearly 22,000 applications, an 18 percent increase from a year ago. Last year's 13 percent increase was the second highest among the 18 Kofi universities, and our admissions staff believes that this year's performance may lead all Kofi universities. In addition, <clears throat> the applicant pool is uh, stronger than last year, at least as measured by the way we measure these things. The mean SAT score of freshmen accepted thus far is 1463, 19 points higher than last year. My thanks to the admissions staff on a job very, very well done. Admissions and other areas are also strong in our professional schools. At Kellogg, applications and quality for the incoming class of MBA students are up from last year. Also, as a complement to the Kellogg School's renowned evening part-time MBA program, Kellogg is adding a Saturday MBA program uh, to incorporate all the, uh, which the Saturday program, uh, part-time MBA program will begin this June, and it will uh, incorporate all the strengths of the Kellogg School's other MBA programs. The Saturday program especially is designed to meet the needs of working professionals who live beyond the Chicago area, who have uh, careers that require significant weekday travel. At the law school, despite an 11 percent decline in law school applications nationwide, applications to our law school are down only about 6 percent this year, and the quality of applicants remains as strong as ever. The law school had a banner year for clerkship placements. When the U.S. Supreme Court term opens next fall, three recent Northwestern law graduates will serve as clerks for U.S. Supreme Court justices. Uh, this is a remarkable uh, achievement. And as a result, one-third of the U.S. Supreme Court justices will have a Northwestern law alumna as a clerk. And I think uh, it's really quite a great uh, story indeed. In Feinberg School of Medicine, Last fall's entering class was strongly qualified with an average undergraduate science GPA of 3.65 and a combined mean MCAT score of 33.6. Those scores continued to well exceed the national means. Also, fiscal year 2006 was the best year that Feinberg has ever had in fundraising with a more than $1 million in donations. The School of Continuing Studies launched three new distance learning programs in fall 2006. And SCS now offers an online master's degree in medical informatics uh, together with Feinberg. A blended learning accelerated undergraduate degree in leadership and organization and behavior with Weinberg and an online non-credit certificates in futures and options offered in partnership with the Chicago Board of Trade. With these initiatives, SCS will help the university gain experience with distance learning pedagogies and evaluate their impact on student learning. SCS hopes to part partner with other Northwestern schools and departments that wish to increase access to their current programs or courses through distance education. I think it's important to note that in all of our admissions efforts and in our recruitment of faculty and staff, Northwestern University remains committed to bringing together a diverse group of individuals. Many of you are undoubtedly aware of the ballot initiative that passed in Michigan last no uh, November and subsequent court decisions that constrain public universities in that state and in other states from considering race as a factor in admissions. Uh, in addition, a recent court decision in Michigan ruled that public universities could not provide benefits for the same for same-sex partners of, a f of faculty and staff. Now, I'm not a lawyer and I don't know enough about the individual cases to comment on the rulings. But what I do want to emphasize is that Northwestern will continue our efforts to attract and retain a diverse community of students, faculty, and staff. And as part of that, we're also increasing our efforts to attract undergraduate students from lower income households by reducing or eliminating the loan component of their financial aid package as much as we can and replacing those loans with additional grants. Focus, uh, focusing uh, for a moment briefly on our research enterprise. Northwestern's emphasis on multidisciplinary research and education programs positions us to make critical contributions to society. To magnify this impact, we're joining 
uh, uh, we're joining with regional peer institutions to attack some of the most difficult problems using our combined intellectual resources and research facilities. Problems such as uh, a, uh, a thinking about energy, a new collaborative initiative in global energy and environmental strategy as being undertaken with local universities, industries, and Argonne National Laboratory. A new relationship uh, will give us a role in managing Argonne and the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory. Vice President Moore and myself uh, will be on, are on now on the Argonne Board of Directors, and our closer relationship with Argonne should provide even more opportunities to work together with lab researchers and utilize lab facilities at Argonne. An award from the Searle Funds at the Chicago Community Trust has put into place the Chicago Biomedical Consortium. That award was a $5 million one, the first of a planned five-year donation of $5 million per year for a total of $25 million. And this allows a lot of collaboration between ourselves, the University of Illinois in Chicago, and the University of Chicago. Let me quickly point to a number of exciting things that are happening in research this year. And again, I'm going to be very, very selective. So much goes on on campus. Uh, I can only point to a few things. But a discovery by Jonathan Whittem and the BMBCB group of an unanticipated ways in which higher levels of information exist in the genetic code. Groundbreaking work by Tobin Marx in chemistry, who's leading a group that is producing transparent, high-performance transistors that can be assembled inexpensively on both glass and plastics. The creation of two new interdisciplinary university research centers, the Center for Technology and Social Behavior, directed by Justine Cassell, and the Spatial Intelligence and Learning set, uh, Center, directed by Deidre Gentner. Teresa Woodruff's newly created Division of Fertility Preservation in Feinberg School. Luis Amaral of McCormick was awarded the uh, by the W.M. Keck Foundation, a Distinguished Young Scholar Award in Medical Research. And McCormick Professor Mark Hersom's 2005 Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, another terrific achievement. Our research awards for the past year remained essentially the same as last year, drawing at just 0.8 percent to $383.8 million. This, uh, while almost flat uh, number, still was good compared to uh, the fact that federal support for uh, research dropped 5 percent, <clears throat> 5 percent, which is a reflection of, uh, of diminishing federal support for NIH especially. Uh, I hope that we've turned the corner a bit on NIH funding. Uh, Congress recently uh, approved or uh, is moving towards the finalization of something like a $600 million increase in the NIH budget. And I'm hopeful, and particularly in my capacity as chairman of the AAU, that we can work towards increasing uh, critical science funding in NIH, NSF, DOE, and DOD, uh, which is really very important for the country, not only for Northwestern. But our creative faculty has uh, worked hard to fill the gap uh, with an increase of nearly 20 percent in funding from private and state of Illinois sources. We anticipate that times are going to remain tight for the next years uh, for federal funding for research while the federal government wrestles with the deficit. But so far, at least, our funding has been well up uh, in the new fiscal year since end of August, beginning September. So uh, I'm concerned about federal funding for the sciences, but I'm still hopeful that we're going to be able to move ahead in an ambitious way uh, in doing more research at Northwestern. Let me just again point quickly to a number of awards that were made to our splendid faculty during the year. Jennifer Richardson, Associate Professor of Psychology, was named one of the 25 MacArthur Fellows, the so-called Genius Award in 2006. Brian Hoffman, Professor of Chemistry and Biochemistry, Molecular Biology and Cell Biology, was elected to the National Academy of Sciences. Surendra P. Shah, the Walter P. Murphy Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering, was elected to the National Academy of Engineering. 
Four Northwestern faculty members were elected fellows of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Darlene Clark Hine, Board of Trustee Professor of African American Studies and History, Richard Kiekeffer, John Evans, Professor in Religion, Richard Kraut, Charles E. and Emma H. Morrison, Professor in the Humanities, and Lee Epstein, Beatrice Kuhn, Professor of Law and Professor of Political Science, Abraham Nitzan, Professor of Chemistry at Tel Aviv University, uh, who is a visiting professor in chemistry, also was elected to the American Academy. In the past year, our students or recent graduates have received 21 Fulbright Awards, and we had nat 19 National Science Foundation winners across a range of disciplines. I'd like to recognize especially four students who received major honors. Nicole Ripley, a theater major who graduated last year, received a loose scholarship. Andrew Moses Lee, senior with majors in the Integrated Sciences Program, Biological Sciences and Math, received a Goldwater Fellowship. David Rubenstein, a senior major in history, received a Truman Scholarship. I remember calling David when he was in Cairo to make him aware of uh, receiving that Truman. That was a wonderful conversation. Aaron Lee, a senior math and physics major, was named to the USA Today All USA College academic team and the third team. On the athletic side, our teams enjoyed some great successes. Women's lacrosse captured its second consecutive national title. Our softball team finished second in the NCAA tournament. Our women's tennis doubles team of Christelle Greer and Alexis Prusas took the NCAA title, and swimmer Matt Grievers won his second NCAA title. All told, 11 of our teams made NCAA postseason appearances, and for the second year in a row, Northwestern finished in the top 30 universities in the country in what we now call the Director's Cup standing, which measures a university's overall athletic success. We also, of course, suffered a great loss with the sudden death of Randy Walker, our highly regarded football coach and a good friend. In the coming years, we'll all continue to build on the foundations that Randy established. Among our staff, 2006 Employee of the Year winners were Sabine Guron of the Kellogg School of Management on the Evanston campus and Elena Garbes of the uh, Feinberg School of Medicine on the Chicago campus. We also had 63 Service Excellence Award winners this year, including four who received two awards. Those four were Heidi Levin, Office of Research, Robert Lilly, University Services, Carl Spencer, Facilities Management, and Anitra Young, Human Resources. Many other members of our faculty and staff have been extraordinarily helpful to the university in a variety of ways. As you know, we inaugurated a new health cl uh, care plans at the start of 2007. We especially appreciate the involvement of administrators throughout the university who worked on this complicated effort which resulted in 99% of the faculty and staff re-enrolling through our new online system. In the aggregate, faculty and staff members are saving $1 million in health care premiums this year with a corresponding uh, savings in the university's share of the premiums. Credit should also go to Guy Miller, our Associate Vice President of uh, Human Resources, for his leadership in shepherding this major project to a successful completion. Guy will step down over the summer after 15 years of service to the university. And Guy, I'm looking where you are, right in the front row. Thanks to you for all your good work on this and many other projects. We appreciate it. <clears throat> Guy, even when you step down, I'm going to bring you back from my state of the university addresses to answer questions. So you, see, you can sit with Tom and answer all the questions I can't. Another important transition will take place this summer when Lou Landsberg will retire as Dean of the Feinberg School of Medicine and Larry Jamison, Chair of the Department of Medicine, will assume the post. I can't speak too highly of the job that Lou has done as Dean of Feinberg since he took on the post in 1999, and I should say he took on that post with some reluctance. He has been an exceptionally effective leader for the medical school, establishing a vision for Feinberg hiring outstanding faculty to pursue that vision, and significantly improving relationships with our affiliated hospitals. Feinberg and its affiliated hospitals are becoming one of the truly great medical centers in the country. 
and a lot of that credit goes to Lou. A group of our medical affiliates, led by Northwestern Memorial Hospital, are making a generous gift to name the deanship of Feinberg in honor of Lou Landsberg. This is a very special acknowledgement of all that Lou has done for the school during his tenure, and I'm uh, exceptionally pleased that Northwestern Memorial and our other hospital affiliates and our uh, NIMF practice plan have um, established this naming of the deanship in Lou's honor. I promised I would report, though, briefly on financial matters, but I will indeed keep this brief in the interest of time. We are in excellent financial health. Thanks to prudent budget management, outstanding investment strategies, and a record-breaking success in our fundraising efforts. Our budgets are balanced, due in part to a growing endowment that provides critical budget support. Last year, our endowment had a return on investment of approximately 17 percent. As a result, Northwestern now has the 12th largest endowment of a university in the country. That's up from 15th in 1996. Uh, my personal thanks to Will McLean, Vice President for Investments, and to his staff for their excellent work, and to our trustees' investment committee as well. Our endowment also grew because we had a record-breaking year in our development efforts, raising a total of $254 million in cash and an additional $189 million in new commitments. And I thank Sarah Pearson and her staff for their efforts in, uh, in uh, making that possible. Generous gifts from the chairman of our board, Patrick Ryan, and his wife, Shirley, are enabling us to initiate a program of no loans for lower-income undergraduate students that I referred to at the outset, as well as graduate students and uh, graduate support in the sciences, which new Ryan gifts will enable. One of our alumni, Roberta Bialik Buffett, has endowed the Center for International and Comparative Studies, and I mentioned earlier uh, that Maury Kaplan and Dolores Kaplan have made a series of gifts that will expand our Humanities Institute with a Freshman Scholars Program. Dan and Susan Jones have made a generous commitment to endow the head football coach position as part of our successful athletic initiative. In addition, Gordon and Carol Siegel have endowed a new design center in McCormick, and we'll be announcing that uh, officially very, very soon. And Deborah and Larry Brady, have established a new program for undergraduates in the humanities focusing on leadership and ethics in world issues. These, just, these are just a few examples of the support provided by our dedicated alumni, and the people that I've just named also happen to be members of our board, Maury Kaplan, Pat Ryan, of course, Gordon Siegel, and Debbie Brady. Now, an uh, important reason for our good financial health is that our enrollments continue to be strong at all levels, undergraduate, graduate, and professional. And in all these places, we provide an outstanding education to our students, and it's clear that a Northwestern degree is highly valued, and I'd like to think ever more highly valued. That's a testament to the excellence of our faculty, the track record of success by our students and alumni, and the dedicated support of our staff. As president, I'm proud to add my efforts to yours in making this great institution even stronger. Thank you very much, and I'll now answer, or try to answer, any questions you may have. <clears throat> we'll give President Beenan a little bit of a break, because no, I want to... I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I want to review the uh, procedures for those people um, uh, that are watching on the webcast. They can email, if they have questions, they can email, once again, newsac at northwestern.edu. For those of you here uh, in the forum room, uh, you can come down and ask a question into the microphone. Um, for senior administration, if you uh, have any, uh, if President Beenan wants you to answer any questions, we ask that you make sure that you speak into the microphone so our webcast people can hear you. And for people on the Chicago campus, um, you can fill out a note card and give it to the NUSAC representative down there and they will send it on to us. I'm going to start off with a couple of questions from the NUSAC email and these are uh, unedited questions. 
That's risky. <laughs> uh, the first question, what is the status of the highest order of excellence and what kinds, of, what kinds of changes have been made as a result of these implementations? Well, I think the highest order of excellence uh, was our, what we called the first, the first one, the highest order of excellence, through a very uh, broad net indeed. And I think, <clears throat> uh, you know, we had a lot of concerns in the highest order of excellence. One was to have more interdisciplinary efforts on campus, and we've created I've alluded to only a few of them, a lot of new uh, both teaching centers and research centers to bring people together across campus. One of the really important aspects was to provide better facilities, both physical uh, facilities and administrative facilities. Uh, it's, I think, we've done an amazing amount of building on campus with the cooperation of many people, but we now have first class facilities in many areas where we did not, particularly in the sciences and engineering. And I think uh, we're, one of the things that we've really tried to do is have a better advising systems. Uh, I think <clears throat> that's an ongoing project, but I think we've been successful in a number of our schools. There's more to be done. I think uh, we have really needed to provide better administrative support structures, and we've done so both on the personnel side as well as moving to do so on the information technology and infrastructure side. So I would say, I mean, the highest order of excellence, which in a way was our campaign template when we started out, um, gave us a set of parameters, a, a sort of guiding map of the world, really, for thinking about the future of the university. And it, while it was very broad, I think one of the most fundamental things about a major university is that when you go to strengthen it, you can't do everything, or you'll just dilute your efforts. So the highest order of excellence gave us a kind of focus for things that we wanted to do at many levels, including strengthening what we were doing in undergraduate education. But I always saw it as a kind of evolving roadmap rather than something that you, you know, said, here, we're going to do this, and then we're, we reach some conclusions or some goals, and then we're done. Uh, it'll have successes, already has a successor, and uh, I think over time there'll be many evolutions of that document. Uh, the next question is, what is Northwestern University planning to do to address the problem that we may have investments that support the genocide in Sudan? Why is the university being hesitant about the targeted divestment plan proposed by the Northwestern University Darfur Action Coalition? I don't think, uh, I think that's a mischaracterization. The university hasn't been hesitant at all. In fact, the university central administration told Vice President McLean or with Vice President McLean worked to um, not hold a number of companies that were deeply engaged in the Sudan. These happened mostly to be, I think they were all, maybe Chinese petroleum extraction companies that were working in the Sudan. So before, actually, student groups, and I applaud student groups for being active on this and other issues, before they were public uh, asking the university to do something, the university had told our managers, get rid of uh, holding, holdings in these particular four companies. Uh, you know, under American law, American companies are not allowed to invest in the Sudan, so there was not an issue of American companies, but of these non-American companies that were engaged in the petroleum industry. The whole issue of divestment, I want to say, I think is a very complicated issue, but on this one, I think there really was a bright light. The United States has actually uh, officially accused the Sudanese government of genocide, so I think wh wherever the boundaries of behavior are, with regard to countries abroad, and you can find lots of nasty countries in the world, unfortunately, um, and the question of where you want to be and how you want to deal with them is, I think, a very complicated question uh, indeed. But in this one, I think there was clarity as to what the Sudanese was, government was doing with regard to uh, parts of its own population. But the issue of divestment in terms of the politicization of the university in many areas is I think we ought to recognize a very complicated question and one in which I think reasonable people could have lots of disagreements about the way they face 
that question. Uh, there are lots of people who don't like a particular company or want, don't want to deal with non-unionized com uh, companies or don't like the hiring practices uh, uh, or the gender practices of one company or the other. And I think one needs to be very careful about how one politicizes the, uh, one's investment policy. Where the university has been criticized, I think, or, uh, and I think um, in an area where I'm not sympathetic to, is that we're not transparent about our investment policies. Well, I don't think uh, being transparent on our investment policies is necessarily a way for the university to go, and our trustees don't have that view. And you ought to realize that, um, indeed, uh, there are many funds, hedge funds, venture funds, that you simply couldn't invest in if you were transparent. Funds that nobody would object to their policies in any way, but that you would not be able to invest in them uh, if uh, you have transparency. They won't allow transparency. Uh, my responsibility, and I think our trustees see their responsibility, is to have a strong financial footing for the university, which means to have solid endowment uh, and investment performance. In the case of the Sudan, I don't think there really was an issue because, as I say, we had told our managers to get rid of these non-American companies. But I think if one is honest, one should admit that divestment policies for universities can be very complicated indeed and sometimes can have counterproductive effects. I'm giving you a long-winded answer to this question because I think it's one that won't go away for the universities. It'll be here in the case of Sudan and it'll come up in other cases as well. There are companies that went out of South Africa when that regime was uh, uh, a very odious apartheid uh, regime, a pretty horrendous regime. Uh, and those, some of those companies have never come back to South Africa. What should we say about that in historical retrospect? I just throw that question out. Uh, the next question we have is from Chicago. You mentioned potential overseas expansion of Northwestern's presence, including those that will award Northwestern non-joint degrees. As education becomes a greater driver for economic progress <coughs> in developing nations, what are Northwestern's objectives in those expansions? Well, I think our objective is to have a worldwide reputation. So one of the reasons that I've been interested <coughs> in planting our flag, excuse me, <coughs> One of the reasons that I've been interested <coughs> in going abroad has been to increase the reputation of the university. If we can do it on terms which are good for the university, there's obviously a shift going on in the world, a shift of power, of economic influence, um, where, to coin a term from a former or parallel a term from a former Secretary of Defense, old Europe, uh, and maybe even old America, are uh, going to not have as prominent a place in the world as they've had up to now. We're, we're seeing very remarkable economic growth in China and in India, Brazil, and there'll be other uh, large important countries that will grow rapidly and will make an economic and political, increasing economic and political impact on the world. Increasingly, our students will uh, work abroad for at least part of their careers. And that's one of the reasons we've been interested in the internationalization <coughs> of the university to strengthen ourselves in the Middle East uh, in terms of what we offer in curricula here. That's something we, we want to work on. But going abroad, which we've done to some extent, Kellogg has a number of joint programs abroad. The law school has an increasing number <coughs> of students who come for postgraduate degrees here and has gotten joint relationships abroad. So the next step, it seemed to me, was to think hard about whether we would actually have a Northwestern degree granting undergraduate or graduate um, facility abroad. And to some extent, we're opportunistic about this. We don't want <clears throat> to have to spend a lot of time. <clears throat> this is about as long as I ever talk in one place. So, <clears throat> so we don't want to spend a lot of time raising money. 
uh, abroad because we have great needs to do that here at the university. Uh, setting up a campus physically is a difficult thing. It doesn't always work well. So we need to partner with people who are ready to partner with us financially, physically, uh, and educationally. And that, that, that does give some opportunism to what you do, whether I could say, hey, we want to go to country X or country Y, but it might be very hard to do that. So I think there's always going to be a balance in, in our strategies about what's doable and feasible and what makes sense for us to do. But I do think there's a lot to be gained by doing this if we can do it in the right way. Faculty members at several different schools of the university have shared with the GFC their views that after spending a great amount of time on, res on reports for program review committees, they have had very little, if any, feedback, and that virtually nothing was done in response to the, to the report's major areas of criticism. Is there any review of the program review process itself and any reason for faculty to, to believe that the time they spend on preparing program review reports is not a waste of their time? Well, I, I think, again, that's a mischaracterization of program review. And <clears throat> the fact is, um, I believe in revealed preferences. Lots of our faculty, and many of our staff, not just faculty, but a lot of staff, um, are involved in program review. And they wouldn't be. They wouldn't continue to do it if they didn't think it was a worthwhile thing. Uh, so I don't think uh, that this is an accurate statement. Now, we did put in place a couple of years ago a uh, literally a grid, you can see it on a piece of paper, to review what happens to the recommendations of <coughs> program review. Now, I'm not saying that every recommendation is followed through. First, some shouldn't be, in my mind. I don't agree with every recommendation that's made in program review. Not all program reviews, to my mind, are equally well done. Some are very good, and they deserve to be taken very seriously. Some, I think, are um, idiosyncratic uh, and less good, and they don't deserve to be taken seriously. So when people are engaged in the review process, they need to know that it is a set of recommendations they're making, not a set of policy decisions that are finally uh, done on recommendation. So, but many of the recommendations are excellent, and they are implemented. And we now have a template which tells us uh, what, what's done, what's accomplished within a certain period of time, what's pending, what needs to be done, what we agree with, what we don't agree with. So I, I take program review very seriously. We spend a lot of time on it. I, I spend a lot of time on it. The provost spends even more time on it. A huge amount of his time is spent uh, being involved in discussions about program review. I'm not going to be specific, but I can tell you that many departments have been affected both administrative departments uh, and academic departments by the nature of the program reviews. Does the university have perfect memory? Most institutions don't. Uh, I recall very well um, about a couple of years after I came here, uh, we did something that didn't turn out so well and it just something jogged my memory and I went back to a program review that I had been reading in Montana when I, in the summer before I arrived here, and I had, had cartons of cartons of old program reviews sent out to good old Bozeman, Montana, where I was summering, and I waded through them uh, just to try to get a fix on the university. But it tells you that I took them seriously before I ever got here. And I went back, and my memory was jogged that program review had said, don't do X or Y, and then we went around and did it. Uh, and that turned out to be a bad idea. And I think we need a better way, and I, we have found better ways of remembering what earlier program reviews tell us. Um, I can tell you from experience in the State Department and other places that those institutions don't have great historical memories either very often. But uh, I think it's an important question, but I think the characterization is not accurate. Program review is taken seriously. A lot of the recommendations, in fact, are in place. Uh, we have a question from the audience. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this is a question that was submitted. Uh, oh, is this not on? Just tilt it down a little. Okay. <clears throat> this is a question that was submitted to NUSAC in advance. Um, the university currently lacks a resource that would provide mediation and impartial counsel to staff members experiencing conflict with their managers. 
Uh, is this a priority for you, uh, for the university? If not, what would it take to make it a priority? <clears throat> it, I don't know what's meant by mediation exactly, if what's meant is an ombudsman or some formal structure of mediation. Um, is it a good idea or not a good idea? I don't know. I'd have to think about it. I know Mr. Sunshine wants to say something about this. There, there, or, or Mr. Klein, there certainly are ways that we try to adjudicate conflicts and disputes in the university between individuals and their, uh, and their managers, or whether uh, Guy wants to say something about this. I would, I would like to use your word, that's a mischaracterization of, of, uh, of the resources that we have. The Human Resources Department spends a very large amount of time doing exactly that, helping supervisors deal with, with employees that they supervise, helping employees deal with their supervisors. And we spend a lot of time in what we call employee relations. Uh, and all of these cases are time consuming, they consume a lot of our effort. Uh, some of it involves what we might term mediation. Some of it is basically resolving communication problems. Uh, when a supervisor and a supervised person have a hard time getting along, it's often because they're trying to understand each other, and we try to bring about that understanding and resolve those differences so the supervisor and the supervised person can work successfully together. So we do do that a lot for staff. I mean, that, that's one of our major uh, elements of our portfolio, if you will. <clears throat> Thanks, Guy. Mr. President, your alma mater, oh, you have another question? I ask a follow-up to that. Has there ever been any thought to an ombuds office for this university? Yeah, we've thought about it and not done it. <laughs> Rebecca. So, I mean, factually, I'm just answering you. Factually, it's come up, it's been suggested, we've thought about it, and we, for one reason or the other, didn't do it. Uh, Princeton University has come out announcing that they will not raise tuition for next year. Will Northwestern follow suit, and if not, why not? This came in a, uh, before uh, the announcement yesterday. What do you plan to do or advocate for this to for to stop to advocate for stop rising college tuition? Well, I'm I not going to advocate for stop rising tuition. Uh, <laughs> I'd be out of a job earlier than I want to be. <coughs> um, first. <clears throat> As our, our own Daily Northwestern pointed out, while t Princeton didn't increase tuition, they had a very outsized increase for room and board. So that on, if you combine, if you do your arithmetic, they, r their total room and board increases uh, and zero tuition led to a 4% uh, total increase in their tuition room and board. Whereas ours was 4.96. Uh, so it was within range. They're, they'll be on the low end of uh, tuition, room, and board increases, all, all in. And we will be, I think, around the mean. So far, we've been a little bit lower than a couple of other institutions. And uh, they have the advantage <coughs> of having the biggest per capita endowment of any major research university. I don't know, maybe Rice is as big or bigger, or maybe um, Texas, if you include lots of money that the Texas administrators can't get at, which is largely building money. But, but for major research universities, Princeton would be at the very, very much at the top of per capita endowment. That's a great place to be because it means that for your financial aid, you're using the resources of dedicated funds rather than your current budget to fund it. For all sorts of things, you're using built up endowments <clears throat> rather than your recurrent budget. It gives you a lot of flexibility. We have the 12th highest endowment in the country, which is great. Uh, I'm not claiming poverty, uh, but uh, we don't have the luxury of not having tuition raises. A great deal of what we do in every school in the central administration is funded off of tuition. So the real question is not whether we're going to raise tuition, but how high we're going to raise tuition in the future. And the answer is, it depends on a lot of things. It depends, obviously, on the rate of inflation. 
So some people say, well, why are university tuitions higher than the rate of inflation? Well, they are higher than the rate of inflation as measured by the consumer price index, which, by the way, is not a very accurate measure of much anyway. Um, but it's a kind of rule of thumb that people use in comparing price increases to, to the CPI. If you looked at a university CPI, it, it doesn't look the same. It's, a, it's, it's got built-in price pressures, which tend to be higher and ha harder to pass on than lots of other industries that can get savings by using more capital, less labor. We're a very labor-intensive uh, industry in higher education. We have costs of library materials, which tend to outpace rate of inflation all the time. Uh, I see the librarian, the new librarian sitting in front of me, and she knows what those look like. And if anything, <clears throat> we probably don't put enough money into those, that area in order to keep up. So there, there are a lot of issues for universities that go beyond a consumer price index. What we're committed to doing is to maintaining our tuition and our financial aid policies together so that any student admitted to Northwestern that we want to uh, have here can afford to come here. And we do that through our need-blind uh, uh, financial aid policy. But cognizant of the burdens of loans on many of our students, we, like other universities, have moved to have a more favorable grant-to-loan ratio for those in the most economic need. We don't want to exclude people because they're afraid of piling up big loan balances. And um, it's a great burden on the university. When the university increases tuition, as I've said in the past, we haven't given back those funds in out-of-sized out of raises. There's no dividends that come to trustees or to administrators. What do we do with the money? We invest it back in the university to make it strong. So if you're ha in my job, you have a choice. Do you want the resources to make the university better? Or do you want to have essentially very low or flat uh, tuition and have the university lose its excellence and competitive position? And that's the choice. <clears throat> Next question came. Oh, you have a question? Or, yeah, go ahead. Um, while participating in <clears throat> while participating in the consulting and banking recruitment cycle this year, I was informed by many recruiters that Northwestern students were underprepared in comparison to students from competing universities. This statement was further corroborated throughout the year by the few number of internships secured by NU students in comparison to students from other participating universities. The career services or the recruiters at various companies attributed this to a lack of strong sector specific career preparation program at Northwestern. If the ultimate goal of Northwestern is to launch students into the world in a successful manner, what is the university doing to increase career services for both pre-business students as well as the students pursuing other pre-professional paths after the university? Well, I would have thought that our pre-professional training was very strong in many, many fields. Uh, we have a number of schools that are very geared towards what I would call pre-professional or even professional training, like the Medill School of Journalism, our music programs, our theater and uh, music theater programs. And we, more than a lot of liberal arts universities, our curriculum uh, allows students who want to focus in one way or the other, uh, engineering, where we have a big engineering cooperative program. So in the areas of financial services, um, I think the new Kellogg Certificate Program will move to speak to uh, better preparation for our students. Now, we also will have an internship program as part of that certificate. And I, a lot of our uh, alumni that I've talked to in New York, in, in the big financial <coughs> investment banks and financial service companies, are very eager to have Northwestern students uh, compete and have internships, and I hope they can help provide those internships in their own companies. So I, I'm not sure, I mean, I'd have to see the data to see whether we really were at a competitive disadvantage. If we're not doing as well as we should, yes, give me specific areas. And if the area is in career services that 
we, we're not providing the administrative counseling and preparation, I'm certainly willing to consider strengthening it. Um, but there are two components to this. One, how we prepare students for in the liberal arts hyphen pre-professional training because we are a liberal arts school and I think it's important that we maintain that. But uh, so one is on the curricular side and the other is preparing students through specific internship programs like cooperative programs, leadership program, which we have an evolved leadership program uh, that's been in, heretofore run by the School of Communication. These are all aimed at honing students' life skills. Um, I, th I would think we do pretty well on that score. If we need to do better, administratively speaking, I would certainly look at it. I'll give you an example where we did. Um, when I first came here, I had some complaints from some, some very good students that they weren't getting enough help from a uh, fellowship office in order to compete well for national fellowships, Fulbright's, Truman's, Marshall's, Rhodes. And we uh, created a fellowship office. We put resources into it. We've continued to put some resources into it. it under Sarah Vox's leadership, it does terrifically well. One of my old students, Michael Actipus, was here um, just the other day participating in a board of trustees meeting we had with students. He was a former Fulbright and Marshall student. And he was telling me, he came to the office the day before yesterday and we were chatting. He was telling me how terrific he thought our fellowship office was. And he's at Harvard now. And he's a residential advisor in one of the Harvard colleges. And he was saying how much better we do it than Harvard. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, I, maybe we do, maybe we don't. But uh, if there are specific ways where we need to improve ourselves in an area which I agree is very important, having our students compete uh, for internships and uh, fellowships, I'm completely open to try to see how we could do that better. Go ahead. A question uh, submitted to NUSAC in advance. This question concerns the troubling state of a program noted in the highest order of excellence on page 8 for its transformative potential the program of African Studies. PAS was known and respected as a vibrant headquarters for interdisciplinary Afrocentric scholarship and activity, robustly supportive of faculty, students, and visiting experts. Yet as of today, it is perceived both within and beyond Northwestern as a narrowly focused insular environment, perhaps poorly administered, alienating to students and faculty. Is there a response to this from the university? Well, I'm not sure that's an accurate characterization either. I am aware of issues in PAS where, um, as you know, PAS reports to the Vice President for Research and both the Provost and the Vice President for Research are looking at the evolution of PAS. But I do want to say in defense of PAS and its leadership, I don't know how you would call it insular uh, if, if that's a characterization when uh, under the leadership of Professor Joseph, it's had, I think, an extraordinary record in going out and uh, getting outside funding, major uh, support from the Gates Foundation for work in Nigeria on HIV AIDS. Very complicated to do that work. I ran big research projects in Egypt, Turkey, Nigeria, Mexico, Nepal, and I know how hard it is to do those projects, how much they can be from the outside look like you're maybe not doing everything perfectly, uh, and they can even be controversial. Um, that doesn't mean that, again, we can't do what we're doing better. But the characterization of insular when I think PAS has reached out and gotten funding that heretofore it hadn't for work in Africa, uh, for uh, involvement, one of the, one of the big uh, foci of uh, of PAS has been worrying about governance issues in Africa, which are very important whether you're trying to have new policies on HIV AIDS or whether you're trying to distribute uh, aid. Uh, the issues of governance, of corruption, of administrative reform are absolutely critical in Africa to uh, the success of Africa, the economic, political, and social success of Africa. And these are issues that PAS has tried to engage. At the same time, PAS has achieved funding for work on Islam 
in Africa for digitalization of uh, materials. We have the best Africana library in the world, and we've had support for digitalization of some of those materials through the Mellon Foundation. We've had support from Ford and MacArthur Foundation. So uh, outsiders have um, given a kind of stamp of approval to the reaching out of the program in African studies. So you have to decide. I would have said it's a quite the contrary, that it's not an insular place. It's a place which has tried to reach out to the world much more than it ever had in the past. And it's, I would have said it was in the past a much more insular place than it is now. And when you do reach out, maybe not everybody likes it. Maybe some folks just want to stay in doing what's comfortable to them in their own shop on campus rather than to reach out. Now, having said that, I don't want to say that everything's perfect by any means. But I don't agree with the characterization of insular. I would flip that around and turn it on its head. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Um, next question is in regards to Lyrica. When did NU uh, start to receive the Lyrica royalties? How much were these royalties? And will any of the funds from these royalties um, have a mention of Pfizer? Of the new building dedication by Rick and Barbara Silverman have a mention of Pfizer? The, the answer is no. To the last question, the mention of Pfizer, no, unless Pfizer gives us lots of money. And they'd like to have a Pfizer wing in this, but it's a great idea, actually. <laughs> Sarah, please note that uh, uh, I, I'm really quite serious. We should, uh, on my next trip or so to New York, I should meet with the new CEO and see if Pfizer would like to do a floor or a wing. Um, they can't have the building because Rick and Barbara did that already. Uh, so no, I mean, all that happened is we licensed the drug to, the drug had a, was first licensed to Park Davis, which was gobbled up by Warner G. Lambert, which was gobbled up by Pfizer. So the original licensing was not to Pfizer, but it was two companies ago. Pfizer then winds up uh, swallowing smaller pharmaceutical companies, uh, which is, seems to be the pattern in the big pharma industry, and they wind up uh, as the licensor. Beyond that, we can't tell them. We don't have anything to do with the marketing of the drug. We don't have anything to do. Uh, with when Pfizer goes and asks for indications. Uh, it's asking, I think, for new indications for Lyrica for fibromyalgia. Uh, it's gotten indications in Europe for, um, for anxiety and depression. I hope it goes soon in the U.S., but that's up to them. So when did we actually start receiving royalties? We, the drug was first on the market in Europe before it was on the market in the U.S., and I would can't recall exactly. It's certainly well over a year ago, a year and a half, something like that, that we've been receiving royalties. We get them quarter by quarter. There's a lag of one quarter, so Pfizer gets what could be called the float for a quarter. If the, in other words, if the, if the revenues are going up, you're lagging by one quarter, and they're pocketing the difference for interest rate reasons, I guess. But we had a great, we had a very good deal. So I think we've been public in saying what our uh, royalty is. We get 6% of the revenues, and the inventor gets a share of our 6%. And we are not supposed to say the dollar terms of what we get, so I'm not going to say what they are. <clears throat> Anybody can do their arithmetic, however, and multiply our share deducted by the uh, the Silverman share, and he himself shares that with a graduate student who gets a fraction of his share, and, uh, and they can look at the Pfizer web site and see what Pfizer announces or what Goldman Sachs announces or Bear Stearns of their revenue uh, estimate for a particular quarter for this drug because the big investment has is follow all the big pharmaceutical companies in their drugs. So I'm not going to say what those are, but anybody who's interested can find out by spending 10 minutes uh, doing their homework. What one area of the university could be improved? For example, a policy, a process, a program, a deficit, and how do you propose to improve it? You know, there are, there are almost every area, except presidential leadership, of course. <laughs> uh, 
even that, even that. I'm quite happy to say even that. You know, we're not perfect, and the university's not perfect. It's a big, complicated place. Um, sometimes you regret decisions you've made. Sometimes you regret people you've hired. Sometimes you regret decisions you haven't made. Um, sometimes you regret that you put money here rather than there. It, it comes with the territory. This is a complicated, evolving place. I think we could do better in every single area that we uh, think about and we undertake, though I think we do pretty well. Um, now, you know, so if you ask me, you know, what floats around in my head that of things, specific things that I would really like to see us do better, you, you'll probably scratch um, idiosyncratic things rather than necessarily important things. I think our budget process really works well. I think we have good processes for how we make decisions. Uh, I think, you know, that there are places where I think we could do better. I'll name one that's just off the top of my head. I don't think we do space utilization well. I don't think universities do space utilization well. We have too much slack space. We, we don't have the hours of, of teaching right. Uh, that comes from, it's not because we're stupid, but uh, students don't want to get up early in the morning to go to classes. Faculty probably are quite willing to do it. Um, they're, they're up pretty early, most of, the, most of them, not all of them. Uh, and so we have buildings that are expensive to build, to heat, to light, uh, that are fallow parts of the day. And it leads to a misallocation of space utilization, which is very expensive. Putting that right is not easy. Um, people are very concerned about energy use. And, uh, and uh, there, I think there's always room for improvement. Though I think, you know, we've done well on using alternative energy sources, and we've been commended for that. It was, I look around campus, I, I see lights at night. I will pick up the phone sometimes and leave a message for Mr. Sunshine or Mr. Naylor. Why are the lights on at the lakefront? I mean, so I, I, I'm sort of, you know, why are some garbage pails overflowing still? Why is recycling not better? In all these areas, I think we can do better, though they're not necessarily easy areas to do better. But, uh, you know, I, I go around the house turning out the lights all the time. My own wife, who's one of the greatest people in the world, is not great about turning off lights. Uh, I, hope she, she, I know she doesn't listen to this, uh, pro, this program, so I can say that I'm relying on all of you to keep this between ourselves. Uh, so, you know, even at home, things are not done perfectly on the energy front. Um, so, you know, seriously speaking, there are lots of areas where the university can be improved. And I think you know, I think it's a pretty open place to try and improve them. I don't think anybody thinks that, uh, I don't know of any of the senior administrators that I deal with day to day who think what we do is somehow uh, perfect or we couldn't do it better. Go ahead. There's a question from NUSAC, um, and it concerns the uh, state of administration staff relations. Um, what would you say is, is not perfect? And how would you like to see what is not perfect addressed by Guy Miller's successor? Well, I think I, I wouldn't put it as administration staff. I mean, after all, the administration is staff, too. We are, you know, I'm a professor, but I'm also staff. I think uh, the provost could say the same. He's a professor, but he's, uh, he, he came from the faculty, I came from the faculty, but we have administrative staff jobs where. And some of you don't have uh, uh, faculty jobs. Um, the vice president for research does. I mean, he comes out of a faculty background as a chemistry professor. Some of you, like uh, Will McLean, who are staff, also teach, even though he's not a professor. He doesn't have a PhD, uh, doesn't come up from the faculty rank. So there's a lot of mixture of faculty, staff, and different relationships. I, I don't think of administration staff as somehow, now, how could we do better? I'd rather recast the question, how can we administratively do better with respect to staff issues? That, that's the way I'd like to think about it. And I think there are lots of ways that we can do better, and, and it's not a question of Guy or his successor. Again, it's a big, complicated job. If you ask me what I'd like to see happen, 
Um, I think, you know, we've done some really great things and the, la you know, I want to say that first before I say what I think can be do better because I think I ought to say what we've really done well. I think, you know, one of the things that I think that guys and his office have always done, which I think has been really good for me, is we get great information to enable us to make decisions. So when I sit down with a book about this thick, looking at comparable salary data across universities, across Chicagoland, I really feel I have good information on which to make decisions. And that's, that's really important because you don't want to make decisions in a kind of empirical vacuum on critical issues of salary, of where we do better, where we don't. <laughs> where we were falling behind, say, on the employment side, we're getting high staff turnover at a time when there were employment pressures, we, we went to meet it. We couldn't do it always in one year. It's too expensive to catch up. But I thought we had very good programs, and we've had very good programs based on data to figure out better where we were falling behind, where we would catch up. I don't like high degrees of staff turnover, which are very expensive. I think um, we did this in the police force. I see Chief Lewis. Uh, we did it in a lot of areas of the university. There are still areas, both of faculty and staff salary, that, again, it's an evolving process. There's areas we can do better. We can, we can fine tune what we're doing better. I know there are sometimes faculty complaints uh, with HR that it doesn't move quickly enough to fill positions that it wants filled. Or uh, Again, uh, I'm not sitting there, and I don't know whether it could move more quickly. I, I hope it can, but again, it's complicated because it's trying to figure out a lot of different things. But you want to be responsive. You want to feel you're hiring people, good people, relatively quickly. You want to uh, not have a huge amount of turnover. So I think these are endemic institutions. I've only been at one other university in my career uh, with, in, with respect to universities at any length. And I can tell you I heard often many of the same complaints at that place that I hear here, which makes me, and that's just a sample of two, it's a small n, but I have a feeling if I went to Michigan I'd hear more complaints or Berkeley, not less. Uh, because again, they're even bigger complicated places. So I think that you're trying to do a lot of things. You're trying to reward merit. You're trying to have some kind of, you know, we're not in the equity business, but we try to have equitable relationships. You want people to feel they're dealt with fairly. Uh, so this is an area I think you could always do better. It's one of these areas that no matter where you are, you can do better. <clears throat> we have time for two more questions. Um, and we have one from NewSAC email. How do you feel the activism on campus has played a role in larger issues recently? How has this activism worked with the university in furthering our reputation as a respected institution that fosters students who think critically and act on their okay. intuitions? So I'm a big fan, believe it or not, of student activism um, with some caveats. The caveats are that it always be civil uh, and that it always be responsible. And, and those are very important caveats, that the dialogue, activist people often are passionate, which is a good thing, and they can't let their passions outrun their brain, uh, and they shouldn't let their passions outrun their tongue. So that um, the discussion of issues which fair and reasonable people can disagree about with respect to solutions, whether it's on the pace and scope of diversity, whether it's on uh, whether we should do stem cell research, whether it's on uh, divestment. These are all big issues. They're moral issues in the country as well as political issues. They go to the heart of defining often who we are as individuals or communities or universities, and they ought to be discussed and debated. And I feel reasonable people can and probably should disagree to, uh, on many of these issues, and that's fine. And I think student activism is a good thing. It's a good thing to say to the university and make the university look back and say, what are you doing on critical public policy issues, whether it's environment, energy use, um, relations among people, fine, as I said, with the caveat that um, the discussion is, as I think it has been, so I'm not, being, not criticizing it, Northwestern, because I think overwhelmingly the discussion has been a civil discussion. We've had it with regard to so-called sweatshop issues. We've had it with regard to divestment. And as far as I'm concerned, 
it's been well within the bounds of a reasonable and thoughtful discussion, mostly. Now, um, some people, if you don't do what they would like, think you haven't heard them. But hearing them and agreeing with them is not the same thing. So uh, university leadership has many responsibilities. And um, you can respectfully hear what people are saying, think about the pros and cons of what they're saying, and at the end come down differently than where um, they would like you to be. And what's the answer to that? They can keep making their arguments and try to convince you, or the world may change, and the changed world may convince you. So I think it's good for Northwestern's reputation to have an involved activist student body. And that involvement in activism can take place lots of ways. It can be quiet by people who uh, simply decide, I'm going to work in community organizations to make the world better. And many of our students do. They go to work in churches, local uh, 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 social organizations on, in Evanston, in Chicago. Great. I'm all in favor of that. Others want to do it uh, through a more um, overt political process, organizing to do that. I'm okay with that. So I, I think I've answered this uh, as best I can. Uh, I think that uh, as long as the outside world, as, wor as, as well as our internal communities, hears and sees a dialogue which takes place in a respectful way where other people's views are listened to and tolerated, uh, then we have a kind of activism which furthers the purpose of the university. And uh, the last question, to end on a little bit of a lighter note, uh, what do you like best about your job, and what's the hardest part of your job? The hardest part of my job is a losing last night, and in, like in the Indiana game, <laughs> uh, I feel very sympathetic to Coach Carmody. Um, you know, I like my job. Uh, it's, it's an infinitely interesting job. Um, as I often say when people ask me about my job, I can't say I like every single day or every single moment. But one of the things I think I've learned in my job is not to get too high or too low. Um, and the other day, actually, you know, a personal aside, my wife said, told me something very positive about something that had happened. And, and I think she was maybe a little disappointed that I came home, it was late at night, I hadn't seen it until 10 o'clock or something like that, and I, I, I didn't jump up and down with enthusiasm. Perhaps I should have. But I'm so used to not jumping up and down with enthusiasm on high notes, precisely because I don't want to get low on the low notes. I think in this job you try to do it on a kind of even keel so that you can absorb the great things and, and the not so great things. But I've always found my job really interesting and overwhelmingly the people that I interact with, students, faculty, administrators, trustees, this is a great place and um, we should really appreciate it for all the terrific people who are involved in it. So I find that um, really gratifying. Now what do I find the hardest? I guess the things that I find most difficult are um, one, when people that, you know, good faculty that you've worked hard to recruit leave. I, I find that very tough because you really don't want that to happen. So <clears throat> I don't take it personally. They leave usually for reasons which have zero to do with me or even what the university has done, They're often driven by their own personal agendas. You know, I find, uh, you know, it's somewhat difficult to be misunderstood sometimes, but I, I can live with that. I can't say that I lose a great deal of sleep uh, about being misunderstood because, again, that's the highs and the lows of the job. It sort of comes with the territory. So, um, you know, the, I guess it's a big community. You interact with a lot of people, and maybe the hardest thing of all is just the loss of personal friends. Thank you. Uh, we are at the end of our address, and I'd like to thank uh, again uh, everybody who helped organize this event, as well as those from the community who attended today.